response, and you'll remember humanitarian assistance was quite limited because so few people had ever provided care for Ebola. Few people knew how to do it, and so training on how to carefully uh, provide care in uh, circumstances, whether they were in Africa or in the States. One of the things that CDC did as part of our emergency response was set up a training course in Alabama to train humanitarian workers in infection control. We trained hundreds of workers from dozens of NGOs as well as the Commission Corps of the Public Health Service, and they in turn were able to do training of trainers in West Africa as well as man the Monrovia Medical Unit in uh, Liberia. Another key aspect of this emergency response to Ebola and all of our emerging infectious disease responses is risk communication. We know that we have our mantra of being first, being right, and being credible, trying to make sure that we express empathy, we promote action, we give people things to do, and that we show respect for the communities that we're working with. One of the secret sauces of the Ebola response was the local communities who, once they took action, really took care of their own, mobilized people for early care, helped protect people, and also changed the practices around the burial procedures. So this is a huge aspect of emergency response. I can say, having deployed to Sierra Leone during the Ebola response, that the West was not viewed initially as welcome we were viewed initially as the people that brought Ebola to the, wet, to the, the region. There were concerns in Sierra Leone. There had been a research center in Sierra Leone, and there were rumors that that's where the virus came from. But I think through the process of response and partnership, trust and empathy um, was shared, and there was a, a real partnership that developed. So like with the PEPFAR program, where I think the United States is very respected in Africa, now in West Africa, there's tremendous respect for what the U.S. government did. Um, CDC and the parts of the public health community and U.S. government um, accomplished a lot with Ebola. I'm not going to go through each of these. Um, as I mentioned, with the healthcare worker training, hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers in West Africa were trained to safely administer care. CDC was also one of the institutes that conducted a vaccine trial, and we vaccinated over 8,000 healthcare workers with an experimental Ebola vaccine. The NIH did a similar trial in Liberia, and the WHO did a great trial in, in uh, Guinea. And between those three trials, we hope we'll have enough data to get uh, an Ebola vaccine licensed for use in the future. But even with this incredibly uh, aggressive response of launching vaccine trials in West Africa, you can see here how quickly those epidemics rose and then fell with the aggressive response. Even though we did launch phase three field trials in a remarkably speedy timeline in places that had not done large-scale clinical trials, the peaks of the epidemic were well over. So important lesson learned was the pace of research needs to go even faster. And again, as, as Tony described in Zika, we're going really, really fast. It's also important to remember what might have been. The Ebola epidemic led to over 11,000 deaths, but had there not been the incredibly aggressive response with uh, you know, the global community surging uh, too late, but at least um, before it got even worse, we could have had hundreds of thousands of deaths. And fortunately, we didn't. When we think about the overall lessons learned from the Ebola response, we, we recognize that speed is absolutely critical. Every minute counts. The government bureaucracies have to get better. Research uh, protocols need to move quicker. And we really need to get in, in country to assist as quickly as possible. But we also know that every country needs to be prepared because if they can find a threat when it emerges, stop it promptly, and prevent it wherever possible, that need for this enormous response will be less. The world does need to be ready to surge, and it needs to um, make sure that we, as a community of, of global partners, can help when a country's own uh, capacities are overwhelmed. We also um, really learned that we have to move from non-accountability to accountability, from lack of assistance to partnership. And one of the legacies of the Ebola response is this global health security work. Um, one of those issues about the accountability agenda is related to what we call the joint external evaluation, 
we encourage every country in the world to go through an independent external evaluation of their health capacity to deal with these emerging threats. The US went through this last May, and we actually learned about some of our own weaknesses that we need to, to address. We hope each country will go through this. Dozens of countries have already, and dozens more are planning it. And that we hope that the international donor community will look at the results of each country's uh, report card and help fill the gaps that show uh, where we really need to strengthen that public health capacity. Lastly, I want to spend a couple minutes on the Zika response. Um, January 15th, 2016, the Friday before the Martin Luther King holiday weekend, CDC issued a, the first travel guidance after we had seen ourselves uh, evidence of microcephaly and the, the Zika virus in, in specimens from a, a patient with microcephaly. Um, that response then followed uh, an enormous activation of our emergency operations center and the partner community in dealing with this uh, emergency. CDC is actually the most complicated emergency we've ever had. We've had larger ones, we've had longer ones, but this one has taken all aspects of the CDC's expertise. In addition to the usual kinds of skills that we have, laboratory epidemiology, communication, this time we've needed our birth defects center to be co-leading the emergency response. They've never been part of an emergency response before. We, of course, need sexually transmitted disease experts because we learned that the virus can be sexually spread and we need entomologists. This, in case anybody in this audience is thinking about entomology, we think it's a really good time to go into that. Uh, people were shocked, I was shocked, to find out that CDC has 11 entomologists. And there are a lot of diseases that uh, insects can spread. So we all need, the world and the US government and the, the state and local groups and researchers need more entomologists to come up in the world, just as we needed more AIDS researchers years ago. This is a, a, new, a new business. CDC strategy for Zika is like our strategy for most emerging infections. It involves prevention, prim primarily to protect pregnant women. It involves detection, primarily these better laboratory assays that can uh, recognize the virus through PCR, or recognize the antibody to the virus through the various uh, immunologic assays. And it needs a very robust response, including vector control, which is not yet um, as robust as we need. We, we don't have great tools, and we need innovation. And there's a lot of potential improvement in this arena. Last week, we reported on uh, this, the one year's worth of uh, um, American women who were pregnant and developed the Zika virus during pregnancy. We have um, pregnancies completed now from 44 states around the country. We showed that there was a one in 10 risk if you had Zika in pregnancy that your baby would develop microcephaly or one of the other Zika associated birth defects. We need clinicians and travelers in every single state in the United States to know about this virus and to protect themselves. And as Tony said, this one is not over at all. So what can we learn from these kinds of outbreaks for future emergency responses? We need rapid detection and rapid response. The world community needs to surge. Infection control is important, whether it's SARS or MERS or Ebola. It's also important for drug-resistant bacterial infections, for tuberculosis. And so we really do need to invest in infection control in our own country, but very much around the world. The pace needed for research needs to acceler accelerate, and we cannot forget the communities, because that is where most of the solutions lie. Um, lastly, just want to leave you with this mantra prevent, detect, and response. The tools in the CDC's toolbox are shown here, and thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Ann, for that really uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I had to smile uh, when you talked about entomology. You probably don't know, but I went to graduate school and got a degree in entomology, and I think I missed my calling. <laughs> But when Zika broke out, I immediately got called as a consultant, and someone was kidding me about the different mosquitoes I was showing on the slide, and they go, you have to know the difference between the different Aedes and Anopheles and so forth. Um, let's move on. We've talked about uh, sort of the research perspective. We've talked about the respond um, perspective. What's the future hold? 
And where are these infections coming from? And what will be the threat? And it moves into surveillance and, and being able to um, uh, really predict what is on the horizon. And to do that, uh, we've invited Dr. Peter Dasik, uh, who's a leader in the field of conservation medicine and a respected disease ecologist. Eco Health Alliance, for which he is the CEO and president, is a global organization dedicated to innovative cons uh, conservation science linking ecology and the health of humans and wildlife. And yesterday's uh, plenary sessions uh, went into this to some degree. Nine years ago, he became the executive director of the Alliance Consortium for Conservation Medicine. This is a collaborative think tank organization. It involves Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of uh, Public Health, University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health, University of Wisconsin-Madison Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, the Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, uh, Center for Conservation Medicine, and the USGS National Wildlife Center. This CCM, much like CUGH, actually, um, is the first formal inter-institutional partnership to link conservation and disease ecology. Please welcome Dr. Dasik to the dais. Thanks very much. So it's a tough challenge to say, what are we going to see in the future? Obviously, we can't do that. But there are some trends that we can take from the past and sort of try and project forwards what's likely to happen. So I want to start with that. Now, um, I'm proudly wearing my Fogarty International Center green bracelet. So I want to say um, a shout out to the Fogarty International Center who gave me my first ever federal grant to work on Nipah virus, which is a very important emerging disease um, back at the time. I also used it to do some sort of um, forward-thinking work where we analyzed every outbreak of emerging infectious diseases that we knew about, much like uh, Dr. Fauci talked about, but we went through and systematically logged them and said, when was the first case that we know of? Where did it originate? And what's the trajectory? Now, you get a nice, if, when you put, up, put the data on a graph, they're obviously, emerging diseases are on the rise, it's pretty clear. But of course, the other thing is we've got more and more people working on them, thanks to increased funding for emerging disease and more and more people interested in global health. So what we've done is corrected for those increases in the people looking at them to get a, a statistical test, are they really on the rise? Well, yes, they are. In fact, they're projected to increase, correcting for the underlying bias of increased people looking for them by about five new emerging diseases every year. Now, a lot of these don't ever come to anything. These are small outbreaks in a remote part of the world that either get, a, get reported very late or just cause a couple of cases that we know of and disappear. Some of them go on to become HIV, Zika, Ebola. Five new ones a year, and about three of those are zoonotic. They come from animals. So this is a real key threat. And in fact, when you look at that graph, the yellow bars are diseases that originate in wildlife, and they're increasing at a disproportionate rate, statistically significantly, they're accelerating, they're rising exponentially, and they represent the biggest threat. They're the ones that tend to go pandemic. HIV, Ebola have animal origins, wildlife origins, as do most of the diseases you've heard about today. So that's a trend. What about their impact? Well, we can get really good data now on the cost of cases of these emerging diseases from some of the big outbreaks. We've got an economist who's logged that and gone through a series of these emerging disease events and said, how much do they, do they cost? What dollar value can we put on the damages that we get from an emerging disease? And that is actually rising at a more rapid rate. So yes, they cause mortality. And if you look at something like SARS, just under 800 people died. But the economic impact was huge, 30 to $50 billion to the global economy. Even the small ones cause a lot of economic impact. Most of the damages are from um, lost um, lifespan, but also from lost work, you know, the inability to go out and, co and contribute to the economy of the globe. Costs most of the impact of the economics of emerging diseases. So the little ones matter. 
their total impact over the next 50 years is going to be something like $3.5 trillion to the global economy. And of course, because we are the country that travels the most, that impact is going to be felt by us here in the US. So we need to pay attention. So what can we, ta what can we understand about emerging diseases right now, based on these trends, that allows us to do something useful, allows us to either predict what's going to emerge next or where it's going to come from. So we can actually focus on those areas or those issues and deal with them. We can't ever say we know exactly what virus is going to emerge next and it's going to happen on the third Tuesday in April um, 2025. That's not possible. But what we can do is look at trends and say, here, the, these, these places on the planet, the places that are red or yellow are the hotspots for emerging diseases. And to do this, we looked at that list of emerging diseases, we tracked where they originated, we corrected for the underlying bias, and we tested what's correlated with that. And obviously, emerging diseases are a complex interaction between the ecology, because they originate usually in animals, usually in wildlife, and human activity, because what we do on the planet drives their emergence. Things like livestock production, trade, land use change. Now, this is a new map. We published the first one back in 2008, I think. This is one that's not even published yet. It's in review. But I'm showing it here because it's, it shows you exactly where on the planet we need to focus the most. It's a strong argument for global health because pandemics tend to originate in the developing countries, in the tropical regions of the world. That's where we have the most diversity of wildlife that harbor this series of unknown viruses that tend to emerge and become pandemic. It's also where human activity is doing the most to modify the environment. Population density and biodiversity are the key drivers, but we also, with our new analysis, are starting to see things like land use change being a key driver of emerging diseases. So maybe this gives us a clue as to other things we can deal with on the planet that are a high risk of future emerging diseases that we can actually change and reduce the risk. And I'll talk about those in a minute. So first of all, if we look at data on viruses, viruses are, are the, clearly the highest threat other than antimicrobial resistance in terms of pandemic emergence. So just looking at viruses, we have a lot of data on viruses. So we look through the ICTV data set on every known virus every known host of every known virus and started to analyze them. Which species carries which virus and what does it share it with? Which viruses tend to be able to jump from one species to another? When you run those analyses, again, correcting for the underlying biases in the literature, what you find is species that are more closely related to us genetically carry viruses that tend to jump into us. Now that makes a lot of sense, but this is scientific proof of it. So Animals that have similar cell surface epitopes are more likely to share viruses that can infect their cells and can infect our cells. But it's a little bit counterintuitive because as you go further away from primates, which are pretty obvious, if you get bitten by a chimpanzee or a macaque, there's a high risk of catching a nasty disease. But what about bats? You know, they actually are quite closely related to us phylogenetically and we're seeing more and more viruses coming from those species. So this gives us a way to, first of all, we can target where we should focus our surveillance with the hotspots. Now we can target which species we should look at for the next emerging disease. So it begins to get interesting and maybe even useful. In fact, this paper is, again, not yet published, shows that bats, out of all the groups of mammals, are the only one with a really high significance of harboring zoonotic diseases. They are they are the most risky in terms of future zoonoses of all the species of mammals out there. So if we just focused on bats, we're likely to find a lot of new emerging diseases. Now, because we've got data and we can analyze these big data sets, and our organization works with ecologists, biodiversity scientists, economists, as well as virologists, veterinarians, and medics, to combine resources and collaborate to try and understand these trends. We can actually work out, based on how much has been shared between one host and another and how much is then shared with humans, we can predict the maximum number of viruses per species, even the ones we don't know about, 
And then we can predict where on the planet the missing viruses are. Because we know how, how many usually jump into humans, we can predict where on the planet the missing zoonotic viruses are. So if you want to find the next pandemic, you should do a lot of work in South America, where there are lots of bat species harboring lots of unknown viruses. You should also do a lot of work in Southeast Asia. So this becomes actually useful. So working with the USAID EPT PREDICT program and funding through NIAID to work on coronaviruses in China, we were able to test out this idea of predicting what the next emerging disease might be. So we've all heard of SARS. We know that SARS is carried by civets. Well, actually, the host of SARS-like viruses, the viruses that the SARS coronavirus emerged from, are bats. Um, we discovered this a few years ago, published it, we found about five different viruses. You can see these ones in green. So we, we thought, okay, we've got an interesting set of viruses. It seems to be the origin of SARS. They're found in bats in China. It's a nice paper. We published it, I think, in, in uh, Science. And, um, you know, it was quite interesting. But then PREDICT came along, the USAID program, to discover new viruses in wildlife. And we worked in China to, to go out and do surveillance in other bat species and say, how many other SARS-like viruses are there? Is there something even closer to SARS? And sure enough, there was. Um, and we've now found a very large diversity of SARS-like coronaviruses. Some are almost identical to SARS. In fact, there's one cave in Yunnan province that has every genetic element of the SARS coronavirus circulating in bats. And uh, there are people out there who are hunting bats in that cave, eating them, people who live close by. And we're now doing surveillance of the people, and we've found using NIAID funding that actually there is potential of spillover into those people. We're starting to see some worrying signs in that part of the world. So here's a way to take the predictive side, go out and actually find evidence of a, of a SARS-like virus spilling over into people, potentially a future pandemic, and then do something about it. So what do we do? And if we're going to do something to this global problem that's very complex, can we even afford it? Um, so let's think about that. We've got these, this economic projection of future emerging diseases and how much they're going to cost. This is the curve we've got to get in front of if we want to beat this. Um, over the next 50 years, $3.5 trillion. Because this is rising exponentially, there's an optimum time at which to act to reduce the risk and to do something on a global scale and try and prevent pandemics. And that optimum window, before it becomes unsustainably unaffordable, is 20 years from now. So we have a 20-year window, this generation, your generation of global health scientists, to try and stop this threat, to try and reduce it to the point where it's manageable. If we don't, it just continues to rise in impact, morbidity, mortality, but really importantly, because our global economy depends on global travel and trade, the economic costs become unsustainable. So in the next session on the Global Viron Project, you're going to hear about a potential way forwards. It's very ambitious and risky and expensive. And we've done some analyses of what it would cost to identify all these unknown viruses. It's very expensive. 85% of them would cost something like $1.7 billion. So if that's, let's say that's a decade-long expenditure. But this could apply to any program, universal vaccines, um, prevention programs. Let's say we spent just under $2 billion over a decade to really try and deal with pandemic threats. Even if we reduce them by only 5%, so if we reduce the number of cases that get into people by 5%, or the number of new emerging diseases by 5%, we get $163 billion return on investment and it works out as about a 96 to 1 return on investment. It's incredibly valuable, incredibly useful. And the reason for that is they're so expensive. So thinking about whether we can afford it or not, I say that we simply can afford not to do this. This is the time to do it, the time to deal with these pandemics globally. Over the next 20 years, if we don't, it becomes unsustainable. So we have to do it, and if we do it, we get an incredible return on investment. And that's even discounting the ethical and moral imperative. So just to finish, a couple of ideas for really future um, thinking. Now, if we've got a clear link between emerging diseases 
and demography and ecology. What we do to the environment tends to drive these diseases. Can we somehow form a collaboration with the people out there that are dealing with the environmental issues and put a health argument for that and show the benefits we're going to get to health by dealing with our underlying unsustainable um, environmental change? So one of the big issues out there on the planet is deforestation. This is in the hot zone. This is Borneo, Malaysia. And as you look out, it looks like a beautiful forest. It's actually just palm oil. Um, and it's been, the forest has been logged, and row after row after row of palm oil has been planted. It's very profitable economically um, to Southeast Asian countries. And this is a, a sort of overview using a drone of what it looks like. Complete deforestation and then the growth of a new crop. Wildlife disappear. So the conservationists have been battling this for years. They use a, an argument that's, you know, there are ecosystem services from the rainforest that we value, like pollination of crops, um, pest removal, filtration of water. You can put a dollar value on that and show that a tropical forest has value. The problem is, the value you get from completely removing it, selling the timber and growing palm oil is much higher. What we've been doing, again using USAID money, is to say, what is the dollar cost of an emerging disease that comes out of the forest when you chop it down? And in Malaysia, those diseases are um, malaria, for instance, on the rise every time you remove forest, leptospirosis. Um, what, are the, what is the cost of a case of malaria and how does that relate to the ecosystem services value? And what we see is quite incredible. If you project forwards, this is the ecosystem service optimal proportion of land to convert. This is an economic model. So it tells you the optimum land you could convert if you only consider the ecosystem service and the profit from palm oil. If you include one disease only, malaria, you get a huge drop in the amount of land you should convert. So this is a strong argument that links health and the environment. And this gets to the planetary health concept that you heard about in the plenary from the editor of Lancet. This is a nice way to bring these two communities together. Now, unfortunately for Saba, the green line is what they've done. So it's already way too much unsustainable growth. But we can now use this in an argument to other countries about the value of the land they're trying to convert. And then the final um, concept I want to get across is let, let's think about where some of these diseases come from. They come from bats. They come from um, wildlife, primates, rodents. Um, one of the big drivers of that is the, the wildlife trade. We all know when we go to um, uh, tropical countries and we travel around, we see these wildlife markets, we see animals for sale on the side of the road. They're a, um, a culturally high value often um, dish to eat. And one of the places where that's really rampant is southeast China and southwest China, where we've been working for a long time on these SARS-like coronaviruses. In fact, the first cases of SARS were from the markets, as we heard earlier on from Anne, um, where um, people were eating wildlife that carried this virus. Now again, conservationists have been working on this for 20, 30, 40 years, really unsuccessfully actually. Um, most people in southern China aren't that bothered about the conservation value of animals. There is a really growing movement around a few species like pangolins, for instance, which are really cute and are almost extinct, and are apparently a tasty, unfortunately for them, and considered of high value in medicine. So how can we deal with this? How can we bring these two things together? So we're trying to do that now. This is <laughs> it's a horrible picture. This is a pangolin dish. It's a young pangolin in a sort of stew. Now the reason people value them is because the, um, the keratinous scales are supposed to give you long life and vitality. They're hard to touch, so it's a tough animal. It's good for your energy. It makes you live long. Of course, it doesn't really. It's keratin. It's completely inert, but that's irrelevant. Culturally, it's 5,000 years of culture behind this. Now, what we're doing is we're working with a couple of different ways. Number one, we're working with the young people in China who really don't want to eat wildlife. They'd much rather be seen hanging out at a KFC or a McDonald's. Now, oh, that's got its own problems. Maybe they've got a veggie burger, but it's better than this. Please, come on. So what we're trying to do is trying to say it's uncool to eat wildlife. And, uh, and for, you know, for this to become something that the older generation do that will eventually fade. Now, that gives us 40 years breathing space while the older generation move on. But that could mean extinction. So what we're also doing is working with people like 
my friend, Mr. Way, who's a wildlife farmer. And what he does is he breeds porcupines. They're incredibly profitable. He captive breeds them. He captive breeds bamboo rats, which I've never eaten any of these animals, by the way, for the record, and even civets. Now, what we're doing is we're testing all of his animals for viruses. We're saying, what viruses does he have in his livestock? What potential new viruses do they carry? Is it safer to do it that way? If it is, it's, it's something that should be promoted. So here's a couple of creative ways to try and find a solution to this potential high risk for a pandemic. I mean, that's what we've got to do for the future. We know they're on the rise. We know we can predict certain things, but really to change global behavior that drives them, we're going to have to be creative and collaborative. And that's what I hope we can get to. Thanks very much. Uh, can I invite our other panelists to, to the front? Um, excellent presentation, Peter. Uh, it gives us some insight as to uh, the interaction between human health and animal health and, and our uh, ecological niche with those animals. Um, so uh, here we are in the open session. Uh, if you've got questions, please come to the microphone, um, and then we'll take a couple and then uh, invite our uh, panelists uh, to go through it. And while people are coming up, I often uh, have a, a few questions, uh, and I'll, I'll ask each one of you. So, Tony, for the very um, sort of reflecting back on your vaccine development, so SARS took a couple years, then as we moved to Zika much faster, what are we doing different? I mean, you talked about going from the egg-based up to um, uh, other types of um, uh, vaccines, but what what is the most rapid turnaround we can expect if we get the next epidemic that Peter's alluding to? Um, well, I, I think the fundamental uh, difference is that we we are now, but we should make sure for the future. There really is no excuse ever again to when you get a micro, in this case a virus, to have to grow it yeah. and take the virus and inactivate it or whatever. You, all you need is the sequence. And once you get the sequence, you could pick out whatever particular antigen you think is going to be the one that you want to direct your response in. The way we've done with DNA and the PRMNE uh, protein of Zika, uh, that's the way of the future. Uh, so that you have sequences that you know ahead of time. It be almost predict what the evolution of them would be. So Zika was three months from the time we sequenced to the time we went into a, a human trial. The previous record before was SARS. I think we can do better than that. And then the thing that is going to be the next stumbling block is how long it takes to produce quantities to be able to distribute. But getting a vaccine in trial should now be a matter of less than a couple of months from the time you get it till it's in trial. Thanks. And is that true uh, with influenza? Should we? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, we still now have, unfortunately, egg-based and some cell-based, yeah. and there is one approved vaccine that is a recombinant DNA vaccine, but we need to do that for all of the influenza vaccines. But there's that kind of reluctance to go from something that's time-honored but antiquated. Yeah. That's the, you know, yeah. the balance. Yeah. It's time-honored, but it's antiquated. That's the, yeah. that's the issue. And uh, you started out talking about SARS, and, and, I, and I alluded to it was the public health response that really put an end to it. What was the message from that? Um, I recollect uh, from my time that WHO convened a international working group and that we started to put up quarantines and screening at airports and so forth. That got worse with Ebola. But what is, uh, I mean, if there was a lesson from SARS, what would it be? Yeah, I, I think a key lesson was that um, cover-ups are not worth it. Um, you know, you may recall the Minister of Health and the Mayor of Beijing were both removed during the SARS <laughs> epidemic, and that, you know, being, op being transparent and open with your situation is a lot better. Um, the, obviously, there were multiple countries that reacted to, you know, Canada, yeah. Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, just all over the place. But the earlier you recognize the issue, the more quickly you can control it. I mean, Beijing did an incredible job of responding once the political level let them respond. They took over the healthcare system. They designated 16 SARS hospitals, yeah. and they moved the people who didn't have fever, you know, elsewhere. 
um, and, and really aggressively responded, you can stop a nasty virus with the traditional methods of isolation, quarantine, really good infection control. It's easier if you get started on that quickly. Right away, right. And Peter, the one uh, exception uh, from the bat situation, maybe it's an exception, maybe it's not, uh, MERS. Uh, Anne talked about MERS, MERS coming from the Middle East. Um, what, what happened there? Could we have ever predicted that one? Well, let, let's, yeah. um, let, let's think about that. So when, when you look at um, the origin of MERS, it's very closely related to a number of other coronaviruses from bats. And actually, we did find evidence in Saudi Arabia of um, bats that carried sequence identical to MERS. Now, you know, that's one bat and one sample. But I think this week, we, the paper came out that showed in Uganda, MERS-like virus from a closely related species of bat, and that's again with the USA PREDICT program. So if you, seek, if you go out there and look around enough, you really do start to find out where these things come from. Now what looks like happened with MERS is it got into camels, became endemic, and that's where the highest risk is now. But I'm interested in what else is out there that could be MERS-like that might be the next one. A lot of questions lined up here. So why don't we take four, uh, and, and then we'll uh, give them a chance to respond, and then another four. Beyond that, I don't think we're going to have time. Uh, my name is Liza Halcom. I'm a medical toxicologist and emergency medicine physician at Washington University in St. Louis. And I also work for Monsanto, which kind of brings up a question. Um, Vector control is one of the most important aspects of controlling infectious disease worldwide. We know the mosquito is probably the most deadly creature to mankind. However, given um, the current messaging about vector control, lots of innovative, not just pesticide control, but lots of innovative ideas about controlling the mosquito, such as genetically modifying them, Wolbachia, all that kind of stuff, has met with great resistance in the public. We need pesticides and we need uh, innovation to, to address this. How can we change that message? Do you have any ideas for how industry can help collaborate? Because we've got some really good ideas at Monsanto, but all without being uh, perceived as having a big agenda. And how, how can we um, help uh, message a little bit differently so uh, public health isn't at risk? Thank you. Thank you. I learned so much from, from, from your presentations. Uh, my name is Juan Lubroth. I'm the Chief Veterinary Officer for the Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, and my, my doctorate is in Public Health and Epidemiology from Yale. Um, one of the things, putting your talks together, um, and particularly maybe with, with uh, Dr. Daszak's talk, the veterinary systems, which are part of this planetary health, global health, such poor resourced, would it not be a lot more um, efficient to tackle the threat at source and strengthen those veterinary systems as food and agriculture or food production becomes more, uh, more of a need and as countries become wealthier, they want more animal source foods in their diets. We need the right policies in place in order for land use management, water, health provide, uh, provision of health care and to be able to pick up those infectious diseases from wildlife to livestock, from wildlife to humans, from livestock to humans. After all, we are terrestrial mammals ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Corrine. I'm from UNC Chapel Hill. And I wanted to thank you for this exquisite um, panel. Um, we've heard a lot at this conference about the global health security agenda, about Ebola and Zika. If anything uh, came out uh, from the recent outbreak is that we know how to prevent, diagnose, and treat Ebola a lot better than we did, and maybe we will be able to cure it. But the world has already moved to the next crisis of Zika. How do we stay focused on you know, studying Ebola persistence when the world has already moved on? How do we uh, stay focused on some of the older vir viruses and bacteria, like tuberculosis, which remains the number one infectious disease killer in the world, or yellow fever, for which we have a wonderful vaccine, but we still have an outbreak in Brazil and Angola. Thank you. Thank you. I bet this is Sarah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah Galvani Townsend, 
And it was stated that bats were part of the West African diet. It was also stated that um, South America was most prone to diseases due to bats. And my question is, has it been taken into account that the diet in West Africa includes bats? Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. We can pause. We'll we'll give them a chance because otherwise it, it gets to be a bit long. So uh, to my left. So Tony, one of the questions was how do we uh, keep our finger on the pulse of current and past epidemics: tuberculosis, Ebola persistence, um, some of those uh, other diseases that you talked about, rather than too much focus on the future. Well, I, we certainly need to focus on the future, but uh, I think that's a very good point with regard to Ebola. And one of the things that was quite disturbing to us, uh, to Anne and I and uh, Tom and others, is that when we were in the middle of trying to get our uh, resources for Zika, you might recall President Obama in February asked for $1.9 billion to address the Zika program. We didn't get that until September the 27th of 2016. And one of the things that they did was to move Ebola money to Zika, which just completely misses the point that I think the question to mention that all three of us here, Ebola is not done. We still have a lot to do with Ebola. And as Ann mentioned, ultimately we hope that we will get a safe and effective vaccine that could be widely distributed in an outbreak were there to be another outbreak. So bottom line is, I, I don't know how we should do it, but we absolutely need to remember that once a particular outbreak is over, it almost certainly isn't really over. And in fact, there's the degree of one of the things we gotta be concerned about that we pay attention to things when they're in the outbreak stage, but often something goes from outbreak to endemicity. Remember, there's outbreak, epidemic, pandemic, endemic. And we can't forget endemic because that'll ultimately come back to be a pandemic. So uh, we need to we need to pay attention to that. Great, thanks. Um, moving on, I, I, uh, some of the other questions were for Peter, but uh, Anne can jump in. So um, from Sarah, we heard about the bats that you uh, illustrated, uh, both Brazil and that they're part of the diet in, in West Africa. So. Uh, do you want to comment on that? The other part, while you're at it, uh, is, again, this interaction between veterinary system strengthening, um, that there isn't enough resources to it, and it looks like it's going to become increasingly important. And then the third question, which Ann could jump into, was the Monsanto. Uh, how can industry work with the government uh, to help prevent and uh, detect and respond to these diseases more effectively and uh, all the genetic modifications that take place, can those be utilized? So I'll let the... Well, first of all, great question, Sarah. Great, great question, Juan. Hers was better. Um, <laughs> I, I love bats. Bats are beautiful animals, actually. They get a very bad rap. People don't like them. They fly. I don't have any hair, so it's not a problem for me. But they fly in your hair, allegedly. It's not true. Um, when, you, when you go near bats a lot and you work with them, they're really cute. The, pi the first picture I showed is a flying fox, a fruit bat. If you just look at the head, it's like a little puppy. It's got wings, which is kind of cool. But the fact that it carries lethal viruses, we've got to accept that. They do carry viruses that kill us. So what do we do about that? In parts of the world where protein is scarce and there's not much agriculture, like West Africa, people eat whatever they can get. In parts of rural China, People have been eating bats for thousands of years. It's part of the culture. But protein is available. If we can strengthen the systems of food production, as Juan said, and do this in a way that protects against disease, then we've got a much safer system. My interest is in how do you then change people's habits of, of a lifetime of thousands of years 
if they eat these bats as part of their normal culture. Well, there were efforts during the Ebola outbreak that I think were successful, poster campaigns about bats. We're working with young people to say, bats are really cool, really cute, you shouldn't eat them. And also they're useful. And what we say to government officers, policy makers is, without bats, you would lose pollination. Um, the, the favorite fruit in Malaysia, the durian, is pollinated by bats. And that always works because they love that fruit, by the way. Um, the, they're great at pest control. They remove mosquitoes and moths that eat our crops. So they're really good arguments for each person why you should conserve bats, not eat them, and find alternatives based on sensible veterinary input into this system. And veterinarians have a really strong role now in protecting against emerging diseases. Yeah. Maybe I'll just make a comment about the veterinarian issue as well. Um, you know, one of the events that CDC had in the last couple of months was our annual Veterinarian Day at CDC, where we bring, we um, work together with some of the national organizations and had over 400 veterinarian students uh, come to CDC to learn about careers in public health and the opportunities for the animal and human health communities to work more closely together. I think it's a great, you know, if you just look at the news, look at all the outbreaks that we're dealing with and some of the prevention opportunities, the fields um, really do need to collaborate more. Um, in terms of the question about um, pesticides and the dearth of um, really great effective control measures for the vector-borne diseases that we have right now, I think the Zika outbreak is a wake-up call that we really need to um, open our arms to this whole field and, and work together, be more creative. But I think community engagement is critical because, you know, when you're worrying about, um, um, when, when, you, when you don't have trust, it's difficult to um, embrace interventions. The, the concept of vector control, pesticides and so forth is really difficult for people because they are not in control. If there's a intervention that you can control yourself in your home, in your backyard, around your children, you, you feel more comfortable with it than if it's aerial spraying done to your community. But I think when people, um, you know, and with Zika, we've had this incredible challenge because the outbreak of the infection, the outbreak of the mosquito bites um, is separated by about six months from the outbreak of birth defects. As these babies are born, people are taking the condition more seriously, but it's too late for the prevention. So I think going forward with all of the vector-borne diseases that we have and the risks that we have going forward, we really need to invest in research and innovation. Um, CDC co-sponsored a, 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 con a vector control summit last month with the Gates Foundation and some other groups to really learn what's out there, what are the opportunities, what are the research issues, but those will not move forward if the communities aren't with us. So I think you know, starting with the community in terms of the research agenda is, is what I would recommend. Nicely said. Next four questions. Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Sulzan Bali, and I'm a consultant with the World Bank. Um, my question is: so, first of all, thank you so much for a very um, interesting discussion and regarding the importance of basic research, prevention, detection, um, and response, and also, um, you know, importance of uh, working with uh, in a multi-sectoral environment for controlling emerging infectious diseases. My question is, I, in one of the slides, uh, you know, you talked about the importance of having, moving from the older egg-based vaccines towards uh, recombinant DNA-based vaccines. And again, that's really important because it cuts down the time. And uh, I also wanted to know your thoughts if, uh, you know, CDC and uh, US government, if they're thinking about stockpiles, because, you know, there is a lot of now research being done, you know, with CEPI regarding uh, vaccine production at early stages. But the other half is during an epidemic is the distribution of vaccines. And uh, some of the most, the areas that need most may not get the vaccine, especially in case of a pandemic. So your thoughts on um, stockpiles, I know there are some for influenza, but if there are thoughts about expanding, thank you. Next question. Thank you, uh, my name is Stephen Holtz, retired from Paul Hogan WHO. Uh, my question has to do with um, uh, pandemic preparedness um, and rodent borne uh, infections. The panel, I think, has uh, very well described uh, the importance um, and the potential future of going forward uh, infections that uh, may have arisen or being transmitted by mosquitoes, uh, by bats, and certainly coronavirus, uh, influenza virus. 
groups, et cetera. What do you see uh, as panel members in terms of our uh, preparedness and our capacity for also uh, keeping under good surveillance of rodent-borne infections that might become pandemic in nature or just epidemic, uh, preparedness and response for that? Great. Thank you. Next one. Jeffrey Theo, undergraduate engineering student, University of Michigan. Um, I just had a quick question. It might be rather uninformed because I'm not an infectious disease student, um, but just on using data to predict uh, pandemics, and also because you say like there are many like SARS-like viruses that could potentially turn into a pandemic. Um, I'm wondering, uh, and you say that, that Tony, you say that the importance of um, sequencing instead of having to grow the virus um, to create a vaccine. Um, to what extent can we create like almost a model for these viruses and then kind of parametrizing them to then re like if it's a, if they're all similar to uh, vex or viruses to what extent can we use data to create um, sequences that can just be you know manipulated in simpler ways um, it might be uninformed but I just wanted to get some of your perspectives yeah great thank you last question uh, Oliver Fine from Weill Cornell Medicine in Manhattan um, wonderful panel, uh, really thank you so much. Uh, but it seems to me that perhaps the worst virus that we presently have uh, is in fact the Trump administration and, <laughs> and I wanted to know, I realize this is a sensitive issue, you all being employees of uh, our government. Actually, Peter's not. But any, any kind of recommendation for what oh, we should yeah. do uh, to be helpful in terms of that uh, disease? Actually, a very important question. Okay. <laughs> so, stockpiling. Do you want to sure, address that one? Sure. There, there, as, as you alluded, there is a, a stockpile for um, some of the avian influenza vex, uh, vaccines. Um, you know, we developed a couple different uh, clades of vaccines for H5N1, and there was a small stockpile developed against the H7N9 influenza that emerged from China. The U.S. government has developed an influenza rapid assessment tool to help predict which of these viruses has more pandemic poten potential, which ones should we develop candidate vaccine viruses, which ones should we actually develop stockpiles for. In response to the Ebola vaccine development work that uh, occurred with the outbreak, uh, Gavi did commit to the procurement of a, a stockpile of vaccine that could be used for ring vaccination um, after vaccine gets through the licensure stage. So I think the world is recognizing that it's not enough to have studied a vaccine but when you have one of these outbreaks, you need to be able to jump on it. Great, thank you. Um, the other uh, question that came up was waterborne, um, the waterborne epidemics. Uh, that we've had a focus on. Uh, I think it was rodent. I think it yeah, was rodent. Oh, rodent, oh, yeah, rodent, yeah. 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 Now, I was going to say, um, I, don't, I don't have a great answer to that. I, I have to say, though, that rodent-borne disease is still out there. You know, you read about plague or something, you think it's from um, the, mi the Middle Ages, but there still are a lot of rodent board diseases out there, and your local health department is actually that front line of response. The New York City uh, Health Department has something called the, the rat newsletter, and they basically update what's going on in their rat work for this, you know, which uh, hopefully Washington DC has something similar, and you know, we really, um, these rodents are out there and they're probably just as bad as the mosquitoes are. Tony, sequencing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point that the question had. So. The way of the future is to develop different platforms that are interchangeable depending upon what the individual virus in question, if you just take viruses. And that's the reason why things like DNA and mRNA and virus vector approaches are really taking foot in what we want to do and why we can be so rapid. You can use informatics and actually predict sequence changes and you could just get the sequence for any of a number of possibilities stick it into your vector, take a DNA vector of an mRNA vector, and you could have that ready to go as soon as you want to press the button and make it go. So what we're doing now is what I alluded to in my talk, that there really is now no excuse ever to have to grow a virus to the point of inactivating it or attenuating it, but just get the right sequence. And if you have the right platforms, our first experience with DNA was with West Nile. 
that allowed us to move extremely rapidly with Zika, which is the reason why we now have Zika in a phase two trial that years ago we wouldn't have been near a phase two trial given what we had. So that's the way the field is going right now. Thanks, Tony. The very last question was on the U.S. government uh, support for uh, much of what we've spent the last hour and a half talking about. And we're out of time. <laughs> Does anyone want to answer that? <laughs> well, let, let me say something. I, I don't work for the federal government. I, I'm free to speak. But I'm very heavily funded by the federal government. And from my first grant from the Fogarty International Center through funds from NIAD, CDC, and others. And wonderful work that the federal government has supported in protecting our nation against foreign threats, pandemics. I think President Trump this week had, an, had a lesson in what pandemics are like. When you have something bad that happens internationally that has potential to spread, like terrorism, like, like a war, what do you do? You don't wait for it to come to the US and then try and mop it up. You go out there and you deal with it. You try and nip it in the bud. That's exactly what we've got to do with pandemics. And I think that something, you know, Tony is absolutely right. The math tells us without, certain, without uncertainty that uh, something big will happen in an emerging disease during this administration and we'll have to deal with it. And President Trump, I'm sure, will get the very best advice possible <laughs> on how to do that. We're in safe hands. Now, right now, there's uncertainty around funding. That's a different issue. And there's politics out there that's driving a, a worry about spending US dollars internationally. But just for the record, Fogarty, I think the vast majority of their money is spent domestically. Even the international grants, 80%, even the international grants um, the bulk of those funds go through U.S. organizations like ours before we send any abroad. And what are we doing with those funds? We're protecting our nation against foreign threats. And that's very, we're also doing good around the world, a good diplomacy and, and um, helping save lives. I don't think it's going to be a problem. I'm very confident and positive about the future under President Trump for pandemic preparedness and global health. We've just got to make that argument very vociferously, and very succinctly right now. On that note, I want to thank our three panelists for an outstanding presentation. And thank you for the audience for staying a couple minutes late. Thanks. <laughs>